If you're a U.S. or foreign student, you have an address and other pieces of information. Now, when it comes to the visa information, I'll say visa country, visa type, because I imagine there's different kinds of visas. I guess I'm not an expert in this area. Visa expiration date and visa number. If you're defining these tables, or if you're defining this table, let's put it that way, for student, would you make these fields required or not? Would you make visa required in the student table? No. Right, because a good number of your students don't have that information, so you couldn't make it required. All right? However, there's a certain kind of student for which it is required. So, how do you get around this problem? You get around this problem by splitting it up into two tables. All right? And those two tables are going to have the same primary key. And there will actually be a relationship between those two tables. So there will be a student table. And in the student table, there will be a student ID, just like we'd expect, and a name, and an address, and all the stuff that every student has, regardless of where they're from. There then would be an international student info table, and I can't write today, whose key would be student ID also and whose information would include the visa country, the visa type, visa expiration, and visa number. Now, every student would have a row in the student table. Only international students would have a row in the international student table. All right, And this primary key would also be a foreign key between these two. Now I do believe, the last time I tried to do this, I do believe Access had trouble implementing this. All right, But again, Access isn't the only database in the world. From a design perspective, this is the correct solution. Now, do we make these fields required in the international table? You betcha. All right, because every international student has to have that. So, all right, what you would do then is either you have one of these uh, rows in this table or you don't. If you have it, you're an international student, those all have to be filled in. If you don't have that, then you simply don't have values for those fields, which is correct, right? We don't have a visa number and a date and all that. If you lumped everything into one table, here's what you could run into. Here's what the database would allow. Since we'd have to make these not required, we could store an international student that didn't have one of those pieces of information that we need. What's more, we could store visa information about a US citizen, all right, which is absurd and doesn't make sense, and our database shouldn't allow it. Remember, to the degree that you can, all right, to the degree that you can, you want to build constraints in your database that prohibits, all right, that prohibits uh, wrong data, bad data going into your database. So by putting everything in this table, then by definition would have to make it not required and we wouldn't know that this was filled in correctly for either a U.S. student or an international student. By separating it out, we could apply that constraint so that if there's a row in the international student table, then this had to be filled in. If there was no uh, row in the international student table, if it was a U.S. student, then there would be no values for that. All right. So that is called an entity subtype. It's called an entity subtype 
because the entity is student. The subtype is a particular kind of student. All right. So the, the entity is student. The subtype is international student. All right. There could potentially be multiple um, entity subtypes for students. Now here at LC we only have um, undergrad classes, right? LC proper, not not counting university partnership. But there could be a student table and a graduate student table, right? Whereas there's things about a graduate student that every student doesn't have, only graduate students have. Uh, there could be student athlete table, all right? which is an entity subtype of student because some students are also student athletes. Any kind of subcategory of student that has its own attributes could have an entity subtype for it. All right? Those subtypes can sometimes be mutually exclusive, all right? Or sometimes could be not mutually exclusive depending on on the design and the situation. For example, the situation I described, they would not be mutually exclusive. If you can imagine, um, you know, a, a college that has an international student that plays a sport, or a college that has an international student that's a graduate student, they would then belong to two subtypes. They'd be an international student and they'd be a grad student, or an international student and an athlete, or maybe all three. I don't know, can grad students play sports? I don't know if that's allowed, but if it was allowed, then they could even be in all three of them. All right. Now there are cases where you have mutually exclusive subtypes. What I would think of would be something like this. Maybe we have different customers of different types. All right. So we have our basic customer information whose key is customer ID and name and so on. We might have a subtype for government customer. All right. I'm sure that anytime you deal with the government there's a whole slew of information you have to, to store about their organization and all that. So there might be a set of attributes that you'd have for government customers and no other customers. Certain federal ID numbers and so on and so forth, what branch of the government they're associated with. You might have another subtype of nonprofit organizations that are your customers. That maybe you have a different policy concerning nonprofit and there's different information you'd store for that. Maybe you'd have academic. And maybe these subtypes are mutually exclusive. All right. I don't know. Uh, I, I, that's why I wanted, where I wanted to go in this example. Now I'm not so sure because there are some schools that are nonprofit also. I don't know. I don't know how that works. But it could be mutually exclusive. All right. In which case, um, you know, um, it could be in one and not in the other. Keep in mind that that we're dealing with a couple of things here. We're dealing with the design of the database. And the one thing that we don't talk about in this class is the design of the application that, that allows you to access and maintain that database. You want to, to as great a degree as possible, put all the constraints in the database, but some things are going to fall under the control of the application, like um, making it so that uh, something couldn't be a government customer and a nonprofit customer at the same time, or making it so that you could put a student in as a international student and as a graduate student. Your, your, your user interface program uh, would have to uh, take that into account. So to review, are two different kinds of one-to-one -one relationships. One is what I call a real one-to-one -one relationship between two different entities. The way to implement that is they'll each have their own primary key and one of them will have a foreign key that you create a unique index on. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute.
you can actually make this one go either way. You could put the team ID in the coach table or the coach in the team table. But whatever table you put it in, you make a unique index. That way you can't put in uh, multiple, uh, you know, multiple rows with the same value for coach ID. So that's when you have two entities for which there's truly a one-to-one -one relationship. The other one that I talked about is where you have an entity subtype where you would have student and international student. And in that case, they would both actually have the same primary key. And you'd define a relationship between those. Let's take a minute and do these in access. Even though, again, for the most part, um, these are kind of rare. It, it, they do come up, and it's important to, to know um, how to deal with them. So let's go in and let's make an empty database. I'm going to call this database one-to-one -one because that's all it's going to demonstrate is how to do one-to-one -one relationships. And I'm going to put it on my desktop. All right. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the um, coach and, and team scenario. So I'll go into design view for this and make the coach table. Make a coach ID. Make a coach name. And other stuff that would want to store about the coach. I then go and make the team table. Primary key team ID. Team name. Maybe the colors of the team. And the coach ID. Now, when we go down here and we define this, this is where we would specify that there is an index that allows for no duplicates. That's what's going to make this a one-to-one -one relationship. If we didn't do that, then you could put the same team in, or I'm sorry, you could put the same coach in for 15 different teams. By going in and making that coach ID unique, then we can't put the same coach ID in twice for two different teams. So let's look at Let's go and make the, the um, foreign key for this one. So I'll go into Tools, Relationships, pick these guys up, and I'll go and drag Coach to Coach and Create. And if you notice, it's smart enough to know that Coach ID in the team table is a unique index, so therefore it's truly a one-to-one -one relationship. Now, I've had problems with the pass and access with one-to-one -one relationships, so I'm going to try to enter some data in now, but if it doesn't work, um, don't blame me. All right. So let's go in and let's put in the browns, colors brown and orange. Steelers. black and gold. And I'll show you how old I am for Brown's coach, Sam Rotigliano. For the Steelers coach, ah, you see it's, it's giving me grief here. This is one case where I might have to go in
This is one case where I might have to go in and trick it, get rid of the relationship, put the data in, and Chuck Knoll for the Steelers. And then in the team table, I'll put in two and three. And now go in and create the foreign key. All right. That's a, that's a bug in access. Is It gets real confused when there's a one-to-one -one relationship uh, implementing the foreign key. And it didn't let me enter it in, enter the data in while there was the foreign key. So I had to get rid of the foreign key temporarily. Let's do the student example. So I could go in and create a table for student. And this will have fields that all students will have in common. So all students, regardless of where they're from, have a name, have an address, and so on down the line. International students are going to have the same primary key, and I'll even call it the same thing. It won't be an auto number, though, because we're going to join this up to the other table. Um, and we'll put in the visa country, visa date. Visa number and visa type. The country and type very well likely would be pointing to another table, right? Because you wouldn't want to be able to put in any old country. You'd want to constrain it to the list of actual countries. Likewise, visa type. I, I again, I'm not an expert on this, but I imagine there's a, there's several different types of visas, but there's several distinct types of visas, and you're not going to be you know, you're going to be one of those, however many. And then when we go in and create the foreign key here between the two, again, it knows because primary key is prim pointing to primary key that it's a one to one. I don't know if I'll be able to enter any data in here. For the same problem, Pete. Yeah, it's giving me it's giving me grief the same way. All right, that's a bug in access. That's a limitation in access. Um, that um, I, I'm surprised is there. Frankly, I do remember being able to successfully enter one-to-one -one stuff. Of course, maybe I don't remember it very well. Maybe maybe it's been a few, few versions ago, and I'm, I'm getting getting confused. Are there any questions? Yeah, probably what you do. Again, re remember and uh, remember that. Um, um, yeah, you can you can make a form and subform. Um, remember that that the database design is fundamentally thinking about how we're going to store the data, what the foundation is going to be. The interface and any application that uses it sort of sits on top of that. So yeah, you, what you would do is you design something that was very workable. Like what you might do would be like this. In Access, what I'd do oops, is I'd de design a form. They had the main student information here, and then had a subform for the international student information. And if they were a US student, I would just fill in the top part. If they were an international, I'd fill up the top part and the bottom part. If I was using a more robust programming language, like if I was doing this in Visual Basic or Java or C Sharp or whatever, what I'd probably do is I would have a form that had the student information a checkbox for international student, and if they checked that yes, it was an international student, that would appear. 
If they unchecked it, that would disappear. So yeah, designing your form and designing your application um, to, in a user-friendly way, allow getting data into this data structure is a whole nother art. All right. Really, uh, in this class, the focus is the defining and deciding on what the best uh, underlying structure is for the data in the database. Yes. Yes. That's an excellent question. That's a good thing to talk about right now because I think I've neglected it so far. Cascading updates and deletes. I'm going to focus on cascading deletes. All right. Um, but know that cascading updates work similar. Here's the idea of cascading deletes. All right. If I have a table where I have a professor and a student. And let's say in the student table, there's a foreign key for the professor for their faculty advisor. OK, each student has a faculty advisor. Not here at this school, but at other schools, that's kind of common that each student has a faculty advisor. And of course, we'd define a foreign key relationship between the two. Right? Now, you have two choices with, and we can go in and, and, and implement this as well and show the difference in behavior. You have two choices of what to do if I were to delete someone's faculty advisor. Or try, let me rephrase that. Try to delete the faculty advisor. Let's say I'm the faculty advisor for John Doe. So Zellers is faculty number one. John Doe has a professor ID of one that matches up with me. I shouldn't be able to delete Zellers and leave John Doe as they are, right? Because effectively, that's orphaning this row, right? The parent in that relationship is no longer there. John Doe points to a non-existent professor. So I shouldn't be able to delete this and keep that there. So. We have two choices, all right? Choice number one is don't let them delete it. If you try to delete Zellers and Zellers has someone that they advise, say, no, I'm sorry, you can't delete Zellers because that would, uh, that would create a, a, a referential integrity issue, all right? The other option would be if you delete Zellers, delete all the students that are advised by Zellers. Well, in this case, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? If I were to retire, all right, that doesn't mean all my students have to drop out of school, all right? They wouldn't need to delete the students just because I was deleted from the database. So in this case, it's probably a no-brainer. You'd set it to restrict. So if you tried to get rid of me out of the database, it would say, oh, wait a minute. Zellers has some people he advises. You better transfer them to someone else, and then you can delete Zellers. So that's the two choices on cascading deletes, to either cascade the delete or not cascade. And to not cascade is called to restrict deletions. So let's go and let's make another, let's make these other two tables here. Let's make a faculty table that has a faculty ID and a name. And we'll make a student table that has, oh, we already have a student table. We'll go and add to that student table a faculty ID.
Now let's go and let's create the primary key, uh, I'm sorry, the foreign key. All right, so I'll create the foreign key from there to there, and I'll say enforce referential integrity. Now my choices are to cascade or not cascade. And right now we'll focus on deletion. I won't check to cascade. What does that mean? It means that deletions will be restricted, which means that if the parent has, if the parent faculty person has some child student rows, I won't be able to delete that faculty person. So we'll leave this unchecked. So not cascade, it means restrict. So let's go into the table now and let's put in me and let's put in John Doe who has me. Yeah. That international students has given me relationship has given me grief. Oops. So I'll get rid of that relationship for now. Now I'll go into the student table and try to put in John Doe. Again, because there's a foreign key, I can't put in a non-existent faculty ID, right? That's not right. It violates referential integrity. So I go and put in one, all right? Now, if I try to delete me, I have a student related to me. If I go and delete that record, it will tell me I can't delete it. That's because cascade was turned off, which means that deletions will be restricted. All right. Now the opposite of that would be to cascade the deletes. And I'll say cascade delete. And now, if I go in, whoops, if I go into the faculty table and try to delete that person, it actually warns me through this code. But if I go ahead and say, yep, go ahead, not only did it delete me, it deleted that student. Okay, so that's what a cascading delete is. Now in this case, it's obvious that we wouldn't want to cascade delete because we wouldn't want to get rid of the students when a faculty person is deleted. But there are other cases where it's not so obvious. For example, if a theater, you know, in, in our theater example, if a theater closed, you can get rid of all the show times for it, right? If, if, you know, such and such theater, you know, went out of business. Well, all the show times for it don't really matter anymore, do they? So you could get rid of all that. So you could cascade that relationship. Update works about the same. If you cascade the updates, if you change the primary key, it will change everywhere that points to the original primary key. And if you don't cascade, then it won't let you change the primary key. Um, when you're dealing with auto number primary keys, um, that's largely a moot point because you don't change auto number keys. All right. But if you made something like email address the primary key uh, of a table, if you set it to cascade, if I change the email address, let's say in a faculty table, it would change all the email addresses in the student table for their faculty advisor. If I said not to cascade, then it wouldn't let me change the faculty email address on the faculty table if there were related students. Other questions? Yes? No. The question was, is would you ever have a table without a key? The only time you would do that, here I'm saying no, then I'm saying the only time you'd do that. Ultimately, the answer is no. Temporarily, you might create a table without a key if you're transferring or converting data from one place to another. For example, if you're bringing in an Excel worksheet, you might import an Excel worksheet into Access and then do some operations on it and make some tables. Well, that, that, that data that you import, you can put it in a table and it doesn't really need a key because that's not like ultimately how it's going to end up. So if you're ever developing a table from scratch, then no, you would always create one with a key. If you're doing some sort of transferring of data, you may temporarily have a table without a, 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 a key that's just sort of there as sort of a working conversion table that ultimately you're going to get rid of. 
Other questions or comments? All right. That's all I had. Um, we'll see you over in LAMP.